welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host. And tonight, I am very touched and I'm very, I feel blessed to be able to introduce you to my guest, Daniel Magai. Uh, Daniel is a recipient of the gold medal championship in uh, fencing. We're not going to talk about fencing tonight. We're going to talk about the fact that Dan has been really a, a victim of communism. And I think that the audience will be very interested to hear. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's an honor to be invited. Thank you very much. First of all, we're going to just talk briefly. I mean, you're the gold medal champion of fencing. And you have, on the last show we did, we had your gold medal, but we're not going to talk about that. But maybe you could give us just a little background about that. Well, actually, that was a very long time ago. It, it, it happened in 1956, and I was on the Hungarian Olympic team. And interestingly enough, when we left Hungary, it was during that very, very brief time when Hungary was free. There was a revolution in Hungary against the Russians in 1956, October 23rd. And we left just about a week later for the Olympics. So when we left for the Olympics, everybody was happy and we hugged, people were hugging each other in the streets and it was an amazing experience. And none of us would have thought at that time that now we are not going to come back here. So we left for Australia, we, we wore the new Hungarian emblem, which was free Hungary, but we had a black ribbon across. And there we were out, we did what we were supposed to do, and then we were out of the 115, at least 100, didn't know what to do. After such a great enthusiasm when we left, it was uh, very, very difficult time for all of us. But you said that if it hadn't been for the Russians taking over, you would have gone back permanently to Hungary, right? I think we, we we all would have gone back. Yeah. When I left Hungary, my best friend asked me about that, that, is there any chance you wouldn't come back? I said, there is no chance. I, I will come back. Yeah. So tell us now how it all began for you, Dan, about your family. It, 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 it goes back to my childhood, yeah. which was very, very nice. I grew up in a family, we were quite well to do, and even known in the city where we lived. And both my mother and my father helped me a lot. One of those that when I was 10 years old, my father took me to a fencing master to learn fencing. And thanks to him, I ended up where I am now is that I was one of the best ones in the world. But then the war came and interestingly enough in Hungary life didn't change as much. And the, the real change started in 1944, the obvious one, when Germany actually occupied Hungary, even though Hungarians had to be on their side. But we were occupied, and that was 
March 19, 1944, and the first thing happened within a couple of weeks that they started collecting the Jews. And what that we went through some very difficult times. And then we had to even leave the city where we were. And when the Russians came in the same year in September, then we met them in a totally different part of the country. And we went through some very horrifying experiences. I don't want to get into oh, no, much I want of you the to detail. Tell. I want you to tell. And, and excuse me, just to go back for a moment. Uh, when the Nazis took over, your mother was Jewish. That's right. But your father wasn't. So tell about that and what happened to your grandmother. Well, that, that is a that is a long story. My on, on my mother's side, my grandparents were Jewish. So when the Germans came in, and actually the Hungarian Nazis started to take over, then the first thing we had they, you had to do if you were Jewish to wear a yellow star, and we because we were half. We were supposed to wear a Weister. My father said, no, nobody is going to wear a, a star in my family. We went out to a rest state. And then there is a long story, but the, the Germans had nothing to eat. It happened so quickly, they didn't even, they weren't at all prepared. So they went around begging, in a way, people, and my father was helping, helpful to almost anybody and gave them a few sacks of potatoes. As a result, the head of the German group in the city came out to thank it, and he even wanted to come out and talk to us some other times, which happened. But then they started collecting the Jews into a ghetto, and my grandmother was also in there. And my mother tried to do everything she could, my father with, with his friends, and nobody could help. So then my mother decided to call up this German officer, and in effect, my mother told him that I give you anything you want, and the officer didn't react yet, but two hours later, they appeared with my grandmother. My grandmother was saved. Then we had to leave. And as I said, we went to this other part of the country. The Russians were horrible. They were raping women. My mother, actually, my mother was almost raped by a Russian. Your mother was almost, almost, raped, almost raped. Almost. Yeah. The only thing saved us that a granite landed on the. We were we were done first in the in a wine cellar because they were shooting Germans this side, the Russians the other side. So, uh, I, I don't want to get the whole story, but my mother and my father had to go up to a German came, an officer, and he wanted to dance with my mother, which is crazy. And obviously, he wanted other things. But then this granite came and hit actually the room next to where they were. So then the Russians ran away because they were afraid more granite could come to the same place, and that's how she was saved by luck. Did they, was this the time that they took everything away from your family, the, your estate? No, that, uh, that happened afterwards. Oh. We went home for wherever we were. Our home was completely ruined. 
uh, we, there was nothing left. The only thing we had is the clothes what we, yeah. we were wearing on. And in the very beginning, we could still live in my grandmother's house. Unfortunately, she was killed by the Russians. So we lived there for a while, but then the communists started taking over. There was a first. There was an election where the communists got about eleven or twelve percent, which obviously wasn't enough for anything. But in the next, during that next year, they accused all the other parties' leaders that they are working for the capitalists. They are, should be put to prison, and in fact, they were put to prison. And there was a big propaganda, and they made themselves to win in the next election. And from that on, it started. At first, it, we lost everything we had. And we weren't the only one. And the system slowly started in, to turn into a real dictatorship. The, the head of the Hungarian government was a man who was in Russia for 20 years. He could barely speak Hungarian in the beginning. Hungary was run, basically, by the Russians. We continued getting into more and more difficult situation. What the communists did first, they either killed or, or put to prison all the leaders of Hungary of the past, and then they started looking at the next layer of people. So that was basically the time when they took everything away. There's, under communism, nobody owns anything. So we pretty soon didn't have too much food even to eat. They kicked us out from the apartment where we lived in my grandmother's apartment, as I mentioned. We ended up in a ancient shoe shop. It used to be a shoe shop, but, but it was a tiny place, and nobody would imagine living in there. So we, there was no water. We had to carry the water from quite uh, several blocks. We had a, a wood burning oven, and we had rats coming out from, from the bottom. So it, it was quite a nightmare. The worst part was that by that time, my father couldn't even get a job. My mother got a job, but well, she worked in a canning factory, and she had to cut up. Uh, Paprika, the green, so every night she came home, her hands were red. But because she looked like a smart woman, they wanted to promote her to be a secretary. But under the communist system, just to be a secretary, they had to check your background, who, who you were before. And when they did that, they found out that my mother used to have a lot of money, so she was a capitalist. As a result, they fired her even from the present job that she had. At that point, we had very little to eat. <laughs> and that was your mother, your father, your, your sister, and your brother. What about the grandparents? Where were they? Well, the grandparents were already dead by then. Oh, they were dead? Yeah. My, so they, we were the only one and our uncle's family. 
And then was that when they started with the KGB? Is it KGB? Well, it was a Russian, Hungarian KGB. It's called AVH, but it's the same and thing. And tell about the uh, material that they got on your father. You know, this 300. Well, first of all, everybody had a secret file under yeah. the communists. Yeah. Every single person. Yeah. And there were spies everywhere, and everybody knew that. If you lived in a apartment house, you knew somebody in the apartment is spying on the rest. If, if you had a little kid going to four or five years old to nursery schools, even the little kids, they asked, well, what, what do your parents talk at, about at home? What, what, what is it? What do they say? What do they... So they just spied on everybody. And so as a result, everybody had a secret file. Nobody knew what was in the secret file. You could, if you, you were mad at somebody, then you reported them. And that got on your secret file. <laughs> on that person's secret fire. So it was a very, very difficult situation. My, when my, fa my father was already dead, when we, co we could obtain, that was after the communists were deposed, we could obtain his secret fires, which was about 300 pages. And uh, I don't know exactly how many people were spying on him, but one was a Protestant minister, among others. And so what happened after that, Dan? Well, by that time, by that time I was in the United States. So what basically I wanted to say about that system is that everybody was under complete control by the government. What you said and what you said about was watched and recorded it wherever you went. If you went you may remember the May 1st parades, which they show on TV that everybody is singing and marching. Well, everybody was watched. If you worked at a company, all the company people were at the same spot. And they, there was somebody there who wrote down the names who weren't there. If you weren't singing, they noted that. And that's how that system really worked. And they actually were the ones who introduced political correctness. Tell about that. Well, it was very simple. What, what the party wanted was politic, and, and you, you, you did say or do